I grew up at Cherry Point Marine Air Station. My dad spent 32 years there, and, and uh, I always assumed I'd be a Marine, but uh, then I took an IQ test. and uh, it was, <laughs> I love to pick on you Marines, but let me tell you, I, I love all you people that have uh, served your country, and there's a special place in uh, God's kingdom for those of you who have served. And, but I do have to tell you this story about a Marine. This Marine... He always wanted to be a drill sergeant, and the reason he wanted to be a drill sergeant was because he wanted one of those Smokey the Bear hats. You, you know what I'm talking about? <laughs> and he, he did 20 years in the Marine Corps and never got to be a drill sergeant, never got his Smokey the Bear hat. He got out at Quantico Marine Base right outside of Washington, D.C. there, and went over to the Virginia State Police. They sent him to the academy, and guess what they gave him when he graduated? Huh? A Smokey the Bear hat. I'm t he was so proud of that. He'd get out there at night in his little whitey tighties in his bedroom and a full length mirror. He put his pistol on and his hat and he was like, you talking to me? You talking to me? Yeah, doing his quick draw. He's going down the highway one day and uh, his car came screaming by and he put the blue light on, pulled his car over he uh, got out of his car, reached in there, got his hat, put it on. And it turned out that the woman driving that car that he just pulled over was a blonde from California. <laughs> I am really about to get in trouble now because <laughs> the pastor's wife is a blonde. But here's what she said. She said, oh, that was so sweet of you to put that little blue thingy on so you and I could Stop on the side of the road and talk. <laughs> he said, you were speeding. She said, oh, I'm so sorry. This is Virginia, and I'm from California, and it's so beautiful here. And I'm sorry that I was speeding. He said, show me your driver's license. She said, okay. She scrambled around in her purse, and she couldn't find a driver's license. She finally found a mirror. And she said, oh, here's me. She handed it to him. He turned it over and he said, oh, I'm sorry, madam. If I'd realized you were law enforcement too, I would not have stopped you. <laughs> I love all of you Marines. Listen, I, uh, I'm not going to tell you anything that you don't know here this morning as I start my presentation, but uh, there is evil in the land. There is evil in America. We have brought evil in. As we've slept through the last 50 years, we've allowed so much evil to come into our nation today. And even though the Supreme Court uh, made a monumental decision when they uh, reversed the Roe versus Wade, there's still lots of evil in this country. And the reality is that Exodus 15:3 says, the Lord is a warrior, the Lord is his name. And Revelation 19 says when Jesus comes back, he's coming back as a warrior. He's coming back riding a white horse, wearing a blood-stained white robe, leading a mighty army with a sword coming out of his mouth. A vivid picture of Jesus coming back as a warrior. Don't you think somewhere between Exodus 15.3 and Revelation 19, we're supposed to be God's army? You see, people, I'm tired of this thing that, oh, well, God's in control. How many of you have heard that? Well, God's in control. I know God's in control, but I also know that God works through us. He works through us. We are, his, we are his warriors. We've got to be warriors. We've got to be ready to step into battle. And you know, Psalm 94 says, Who will take a stand against this evil for me? Who will rise up against these doers of iniquity? He's talking to us. He's talking to me and you. People that have been washed in the blood of Jesus Christ. People who have accepted him as our redeemer. We are the ones that that's talking to. We have to be prepared to step into battle and to go to war. And I believe this is a church of warriors just based on who pastors this church because he certainly is. And I believe that this church is a warrior church and we've got to get out and make more warriors. But I'm going to tell you this too. God loves the warrior. And I'm going to tell you a little bit of my story. I'll truncate it a little bit today in the interest of time. But I believe God loves the warrior. And if you look in the Bible and you look at the things that God chose a warrior for when he had to do something important, he chose a warrior in so many cases. And they weren't all men, by the way. Just go to the book of Esther. Read about Esther, this woman who was called 
for such a time as this, as, as the word says. I uh, came into the Delta Force at the very beginning. It, it was founded in 1978. Uh, they called me and asked me to go through the, the, uh, what they called the assessment and selection process. And they told me this is going to be the very toughest thing you've ever been involved in in your life. You need to be in top physical condition, and it's going to be 30 days. And if you make it through this 30 days, we're going to ask you to volunteer for an assignment in this new unit that's being formed. They didn't tell me it was the Delta Force at that time. I went through it, and uh, as I told the audience this morning, the last day of the thing, we started with 118 people. And the last day in the mountains, uh, in the middle of the winter with very heavy loads, uh, we went 40 miles. We came through 30 days, and the last day was 40 miles through those mountains, and I did it in 11 hours and 27 minutes. And uh, when we got through, we had uh, exactly 19 people left of the 118 that started. 19 people left. They brought us back to Fort Bragg. They uh, took us into a room. A psychologist came in. He came in with all these tests. He gave us a battery of tests. Any psychologist in here? Because if there are, I want to lay hands on you. <laughs> that psychologist set me down, and I'd been very open about my faith. I had not tried to hide my faith. I'd been very open about it the whole time, that 30 days that we were going through this thing. And uh, this psychologist said, well, he said, Captain Boykin, he said, I'm going to recommend against you being uh, part of this new Delta Force. And I said, why? And he said, well, because... Uh, you won't fit in here. He said, you rely too much on your faith. And I thought, and you rely on your nose to breathe and I'm going to break it for you. <laughs> now, I'm a little more sanctified now. I was a young Christian at the time. But, uh, but let me tell you, they wound up taking me in spite of the psychologist. But for the next two years after they took me into the Delta Force there, I thought the commander of the Delta Force hated me. It's a cantankerous old colonel named Charlie Beckham. He's been shot in the belly in Vietnam with a 50 caliber and survived it. And uh, Charlie, I thought he hated me. He treated me with, with contempt. He treated me worse than any of his officers, and I could not figure it out. So I was just about to leave. And, uh, and, and you know why he treated me that way? It took me years to figure it out. But you know why he treated me that way? He treated me that way because I said I was a Christian. Now, he wasn't looking to catch me in something. What he was doing was looking to see if I was truly a Christian. Because people are searching for truth. You see, when you say you're a Christian, you better live it. Because people do watch you. And they don't watch you just to catch you in something. They watch you because they want to see if you're the real deal. They're looking for truth. And Charlie Beckles was looking for truth. And I thought that he hated me. And in the night of the 24th of April, 1980, we were standing in a Russian mid-base in a place called Wadi Kenya, Egypt. Jimmy Carter was sending us into Tehran, Iran to rescue 52 Americans that were being held at the U.S. Embassy in Tehran by the followers of the Ayatollah Khomeini. And T Carter told us to go in, rescue them, bring them home. And uh, as we stood in that big base, old Charlie Beckwith came up to me and he said, tomorrow morning before we launch this operation, he said, would you get these men together and would you pray and ask God to go with us? And I, that's when I realized I'd passed his test. I'd met his standard for whatever a Christian was supposed to be. I'd met his standard. And I, uh, I said, of course I will. The next morning, and on my website, there's actually a photograph of me. I'm standing up on a big platform and I got a beard and, and we're all in civilian clothes. We were going in in civilian clothes because it was Ramadan. And if we had to do an escape and evasion... We figured we'd get out a whole lot quicker with, uh, or easier with uh, civilian clothes than if we were in a military uniform. So uh, I'm standing up on there, and, I, I, and, and we got these guys together, and we read from Isaiah 6, 8. Also, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send, and who will go for us? And said, I, here am I, send me. You know what? God is still asking that question. Who'll go? Who'll go? And the warriors are the ones that he's looking for. The warriors that will say, here am I, send me. And then we began to pray, and I led the prayer. And I said, Father, in the name of Jesus, go with us. Keep your hands upon us and bring us home to our families in Jesus' name. And we sang, God bless America, 
right there in that MIG base hangar. And we launched that operation. That night, about 18 hours after we sang God Bless America, we landed about 100 miles from Tehran uh, in the middle of the desert, a very dark night. We landed in C-130s. We brought uh, RH-53 helicopters, the big Jolly Green Giants, off the USS Nimitz. They came in, pulled in behind the C-130s. We rolled hoses out the back. We refueled those helicopters. And one of those helicopters, when he was getting ready to lift off, he started to lift off, and all of a sudden the sand blew up, the dust, the dark, and, uh, and he went vertigo. You pilots say vertigo. You lost, he lost his equilibrium. And he couldn't hold it, and all of a sudden he crashed right on top of the C-130 sitting on the desert floor there. And I, was, I wasn't as far as from here to the back of the church. I was walking towards it. It's darker out there, and all of a sudden there was this big, huge ball of fire. And I, uh, and I, I threw my hands up to shield myself from the heat, and I turned to run. And as I turned to run, I heard that still, small voice of the Lord. And you say, you heard the voice of the Lord? Yes, God does speak to you. He will speak to you, but you've got to learn how to hear his voice. Sometimes it's in the scripture. Sometimes it's through another person. And sometimes it's just that still, small voice that you may call your conscience or whatever, but God does speak. And I, I, I just felt that still, small voice saying, stop. I stopped and turned around, and that's when I realized 45 of those Delta Force men that stood in the desert in Wadi Kenya, Egypt, and prayed that prayer and sang, God bless America, were hopelessly trapped inside that burning wreckage, and they were going to die. And there was nothing I could do but go back to my source. I wrote a book one time with uh, my battle buddy, Stu Weber, from, from Oregon. He used to be with Promise Keepers. And uh, Vietnam, he was a uh, Green Beret in Vietnam, and, and he and I are battle buddies, and we wrote a book called The Warrior Soul, and we write a chapter in there, I do, uh, called The Power of a Ten-Second Prayer. You know what? The Pharisees and the Sadducees prayed all of these long prayers. Doesn't it frustrate you when and you ask somebody to pray and they give a sermon? Huh? Huh? That just frosts me. All, we're trying to eat. All you would need to say is, bless the food, Lord. And... Uh, yeah. yeah, anyhow. So I, I, saw that, I saw that fire burning and raging, and I just stopped and said, Father, in the name of Jesus, I'm asking you to bring these men out alive. They trusted you, God. Bring them home in Jesus' name. Ten-second prayer. Prior of a ten-second prayer. And all of a sudden, the right troop door on that C-130 opened up, and, and uh here comes 45 men jumping out through those flames, running out across the desert there. Let me tell you, it was like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Remember the story? They got thrown in that fiery furnace. It was heated seven times hotter. It even killed some of the guards when they threw them in. And all of a sudden, Nebuchadnezzar jumped up, ran over there, looked down in there, and said, yo, dudes, check this out. That's the way they talked. I speak the language. And he said, didn't we throw three in here? And I see a fourth, and he looks like the Son of God. You know what? The one promise in the Bible that we need to keep tucked away in our heart, if you don't do anything else, is his promise that I'll never leave you nor forsake you. It doesn't say except when, except when you've been naughty, except when you haven't done what I, caused, I ask you to do. It says I will never leave you nor forsake you. And we've got to keep that tucked away in our hearts. Well, I saw a miracle that night, and it buoyed my faith in an incredible way. In 1983, the Russians and the Cubans were building airfields on a little island off the north coast of South America. It was an island called Grenada. And they were building airfields that were long enough that they could put Russian MiGs and Russian fighters, and they were all in range of the United States, and a great man of faith, a man of faith, said, that is not going to happen in my hemisphere on my watch. And that was, you know, it was uh, California's finest. It was Ronald Reagan. He told us to go down there and to spearhead the operation to go in and take that island away from the Cubans and the Russians and to turn it back over to the people of Grenada, the people that were elected to govern that island. As we got ready to launch that operation out of our base at Fort Bragg, one of those uh, 
sergeants that had been caught inside that burning wreckage just a couple of years earlier in, in Iran came up to me, got right up in my face, and he said, Major Boykin, we ain't launching this operation until you pray. I said, yeah, I think that's a good idea. <laughs> I stood up on the platform in the loading dock there at our facilities at Fort Bragg, North Carolina, and we began to pray, and we began to say, Lord, I, I, I'm just asking you to bring these men home. I'm asking you to give them success on the battlefield and bring them home to their families in Jesus' name. And then we sang, God bless America, right there at the loading dock, and we launched that operation. The next morning, <clears throat> just as the sun came up over the Caribbean, we were coming in. I was in the lead Black Hawk. We'd never used Black Hawks in combat before. This was the first time ever. And I'm sitting in the right troop door. I got my magazines stacked up. I got my AR-15 up under my arm here. And uh, we know we're going to have to fight. We were going into a prison, and it was called Richmond Hill Prison. And it was where the political prisoners were, were being held. And they were, we were supposed to get them out and put them back into the positions that they'd been elected to. And uh, we knew we were going to have to fight for it. We knew they weren't going to just surrender that without a fight. So we were coming in, and, and all of a sudden as we came in, and the helo throttled back to start settling in. They opened up on us with these 50 caliber uh, anti-aircraft guns. And I'm telling you, the red and, tra and green tracers coming at us, and, and then you hear the popping sound. They're going through the rotor blades. They're hitting the body of the helicopter, and we jinking and jiving and trying to get away from it, and all of a sudden I hear wham, wham, and I knew I'd been hit. I've been hit up in the side of my chest with one of these 50 cows, and it just took a, a chunk out of my chest. It didn't go into my lungs or anything, but it took a big chunk out, but that wasn't the problem. The problem was it, another round went up through my armpit, and, uh, and I thought they shot my arm off, and I reached over to stop the bleeding, and then I realized, no, I still got an arm, and I picked it up and laid it across my chest, and then the pain set in, and uh, we made a second attempt to get in there. My helicopter was hit with 50 four of those rounds, and we were still flying, still flying. Five people on there, including the co-pilot, were hit. I was the most severe, and uh, they, they had no place to go, so they took us out to a carrier, landed us on a carrier, took me straight into surgery, brought me out of surgery, put me on an airplane, took me straight back to Fort Bragg, straight into surgery for the second time, and I woke up, and I, I, I told people this morning, I got to be careful right here. I woke up in the, yeah, recovery room. I said delivery room one time and it didn't go over well. <laughs> so I woke up in the recovery room and they said, sir, you have a serious injury. And I said, really? <laughs> no. Imagine that. I mean, I got a baseball sized hole in the side of my chest, no armpit and an arm that is totally functionless. And they said, sir, you, you, you need to understand. First of all, you, the, the arm and the bone in your arm, your humerus has been shot completely into it, shattered. And, but they said, that's not the real problem. The real problem is that the nerve has been shot into and that nerves do not regenerate. We need to take your arm off. And I said, okay, what's plan B? And they said, sir, you, you need to understand, this is serious. If we don't take your arm off, there's so much shrapnel and bullet fragments in you that it may cause an infection and you may, it may kill you. I said, let me tell you something. I have been praying, and God has assured me that if I'll trust him, he will heal me. Now, some of you say, yeah, yeah. He assured me. That if I would trust him, he would heal me. And uh, they said, well, you certainly have a good attitude. <laughs> you don't even know what I'm talking about. And I said, do the best you can. God will do the rest. So they put me in a, this is 1983. This is good technology. So they put me in a cast that came all around my body. And they got a stick like this, you know. So after the third day in the hospital, they said, we're going to let you go home, but you have to stay upright. You cannot get, lay down. You got to stay upright. You got to sleep in a chair or something. So I went home, and let me tell you something. When those opioids wore off, I'm not, I'm not kidding. I didn't even realize I was on opioids, but when they wore off, 
I was in the most tormenting pain that I, you, it, you can't imagine how much it hurt. I know, ladies, what you're thinking. <laughs> See? I have all these women out here going, yeah, yeah. Huh? He's never had a baby. <laughs> May I suggest, ladies, if it hurts that bad, don't have any more. <laughs> and I was so, and, and here's what I did. Now, I'm not joking about this. I said, huh. I said, why me, Lord? Why me? I'm a Christian. I'm not supposed to suffer. That is not scriptural. It says, it rains on the just and the unjust. It says, in this world, we will have trials. But he goes on to say, take heart. I've overcome the world. But we're, we have no guarantee that we will not suffer. We have a guarantee that he'll be with us. That he'll be with us no matter what. And then I actually did this, and I'm not joking about this. I was, I was tormented. I was sitting there crying like a little girl. I've just offended some little girl. And anyhow, I said, I said, Lord, in case you forgot, I'm the one that said the prayer before we launched, and if you don't heal me, it's going to look bad on you. I did. Let me tell you, here's the arm they wanted to take off. And uh, yeah. It is uh, probably a quarter of an inch shorter than the other one, but let me tell you this. I used to, I was, I was telling somebody this morning, uh, I used to take my wife to the gym on my birthday. And I was, up until I was about 65, I'd, I'd rack up 300 pounds and I'd bench press it one time just to impress her. And she would just squeal with glee. <laughs> and, oh, and, and then I'd spend the rest of the year recovering from it, you know. <laughs> and, uh, but she would just, she, she squealed, and, I, and then it dawned on me. She takes in stray dogs, too, so <laughs> she, she's just that kind of person, you know. But 1989, President George H.W. Bush told us to uh, go into Panama and take down a notorious warlord dictator named Manuel Noriega, a man who was abusing his own people, a man who had taken over his government from his people. And, uh, and they finally killed a Navy, a U.S. Navy lieutenant down there, and that's when George H.W. Bush said, go down there, take that island away from him, put the people back in charge, and uh, bring him to justice. We got ready to launch that operation out of Howard Air Force Base. And for those who don't know, the canal... And the canal zone at one time was sovereign U.S. territory. And we had an Air Force base in there named Howard Air Force Base. And uh, we were launching this operation out of there. And uh, I stood up on a, there's This is on my website, too. You can see a, a picture of this. I stood up on the table and, and uh, began to pray before we launched that operation. And uh, I prayed, God... We ask for your hand upon us, for your blessings upon us. Bring us home to our families in Jesus' name. And then we sang God Bless America in that hangar down there at uh, Howard Air Force Base. And we launched that operation. The first mission was to go into a place called Carcel Modelo Prison. And it was, uh, it was where a man named Kurt Muse was being held. Kurt Muse had... Um, had been running uh, anti-Noriega propaganda with some radio equipment that the CIA provided him, and they caught him and they locked him up, and George H.W. said, bring him home. Make that the first thing. And by the way, it's the most amazing thing. It doesn't matter where I am on the 20th of December every year. I'm talking every year, 20th of December, I get a phone call from Kurt Muse. And Kurt Muse says, I'm just calling to thank you for my freedom. It's amazing. He finds me wherever I am, I don't, it, which scares me a little bit sometimes. <laughs> but he finds me. At any rate, we came out across that canal 
and this was the first mission. And uh, I was sitting in the command and control Black Hawk, and we came across that canal. And man, let me tell you, the skies erupted. Red tracers, green tracers, have come in both sides, coming over through under the, the belly of the helicopter, over the top. And uh, and I'm thinking, not again. You know, we're going to go through this again. And all of a sudden, we ducked down as low as we could get. And we came in low and then popped up right at the prison, landed on the top of the prison, blew the hole in the top of the prison, went down to the third level, blew the cell off of the door off of uh, Kurt Mew's cell. And uh, we went in and got him out, brought him back up to the top, put him in one of these things called a little bird. And now you can guess why it's called a little bird, right? <laughs> hey, we only got one Marine in here, so come on, guys. <laughs> we got... It's, I'm sorry. <laughs> I, you army guys are going to have to help me get out of here now. Cause I'm about to get whooped. Hey, Chuck, you going to help me out, bro? Yeah, okay. All right. We put him in a little bird, and the little birds, these uh, little small helicopters, they have a pot on the outside that rolls down, and then the guys sit on the outside, and they kind of hold on. And... Uh, it took off the roof. They had uh, Kurt Muse on the inside. They took off, started down through the streets of Panama City. And all of a sudden, they started taking fire. And uh, it shot one guy in the leg. Uh, another guy got hit in the chest. And the helicopter, they hit the hydraulics. And the helicopter went in hard. Wham! And uh, the guy on the inside with Kurt Muse jumped out and started to run. And, uh, and he... Rotor blades were still turning, and they hit him in the head. He had a helmet on, but it hit him in the head, knocked him silly. And then uh, one of the guys, the helicopter landed on his foot, and he had to cut three of his own toes off to get out from under it. And, but let, let me tell you that every one of those men went back to full duty. Every one of them survived, went back to full duty, including the guy. The guy that uh, the helicopter landed on his, on his foot. Uh, he actually ran a half marathon uh, six months later, missing three toes that he had to cut off. God loves the warrior. God loves the warrior. We've got to be warriors in God's kingdom. In August of 1993, Billy, I shouldn't say Billy, I should say a president at the time, um, he had a brother named Billy who was big into beer. Remember Billy Beer? Uh, yeah, at, at any rate. He sent us into Panama. I mean, he sent us into uh, Africa to a place called Mogadishu. And he, we were there to bring down a notorious warlord named Muhammad Free Adid. And uh, Adid was the head of the Habagator clan. Adid wanted to take over all of Somalia, including the capital city of Mogadishu, and he wanted to start with the capital city of Mogadishu. And in one operation, Adid's lieutenants and, and his militia killed 24 Pakistani peacekeepers that were just out there with, green, with blue berets of the United Nations on, and they killed 24 Pakistani peacekeepers trying to feed hungry people. And uh, that's when the United Nations said, bring him to justice. So I got off that airplane there as we landed on the airfield. I got off that airplane. And let me tell you something. When I got off on the airplane and I stepped out onto the tarmac there, I felt the presence of evil. Now, I know some of you may look at me like, uh, you're one of those. Yep, I am. I am. Talk to some of these missionaries that have served in places where witchcraft is practiced and ask them. They'll tell you they feel the presence of evil. You can feel you know how you feel the joy of the Lord? You know how you feel the presence of the Holy Spirit when you're worshiping here? When you get around, you ask any of these guys that have been in combat in places like Afghanistan and Mogadishu, I mean, in, uh, in Iraq and places like that, ask them. They've been around evil. They've been around evil. They felt it, and I felt evil. So I said to my little chaplain, I said, Chaplain, I don't care where you do it. You go set up some place that you can preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. The gospel. I want them to hear the gospel. The Bible says you shall know the truth. 
and tr the truth shall make you free. The truth shall make you free. That's the truth is that Jesus Christ was born of a virgin, raised as a man, went to Calvary and died on a cross. And on the third day, hallelujah, he came back to life. And today he reigns in heaven with God, the Father. That's the gospel. And I told that chap, I said, you just set it up and you preach the gospel. You preach the gospel every day, every day. I, want these men, I don't want these men to go into that evil city until they've at least heard the gospel and know the truth. So he set his stuff up. He started preaching twice a day. He, and men would come and go, come and go. But he was preaching the gospel. And uh, finally, we got the orders to start to, to launch our operations in there to go after Adid and his infrastructure, his, his lieutenants. And the problem with the movie Black Hawk Down is you only see really one day's operations. The fact is, we went in that city six times before that big operation on the 3rd of October. We went in there six times. We killed a lot of people. I'm not proud of that. And I would pray for the Somalis, and I'd say, Lord, just let them throw down their weapons and run. But if they, if they stood and fought, we always prevailed. But then on the 3rd of October, my uh, mother's birthday, as a matter of fact, uh, we started getting an intelligence that several of Adid's lieutenants were, uh, were having a meeting down at a place called the Bakara Market. It was the worst part of Mogadishu. It was a place we did not want to go. And, uh, but we had the orders, and we, so we saddled up, and we got ready to launch it. Right before I launched that operation, I got down on my knees in the Joint Operations Center where everybody could see me, and I just said, Father, in the name of Jesus, I'm asking you now, to protect my men. I commit them into your hands, Lord, in Jesus' name. And uh, I reached over, grabbed a handset on my radio, and the code word to launch the operation was Irene. And I said, Irene, Irene, Irene. Men started running out onto the airfield, jumping into the helicopters. The rotor blades started turning pretty soon. The noise was almost overpowering. And um, in the uh, lead helicopter lifted off and went out over the water. The rest of them followed him out over the ocean there. They got turned inbound to the Bacara market. And 15 minutes after I said, Irene, 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 100 Americans were locked in an 18-hour battle with tens of thousands of wild-eyed, drug-crazed Somalis. Drug-crazed. They chew a thing called cot. And it's, it's a narcotic that, that makes them very erratic and unpredictable. And, uh, and for 18 hours, we fought a, a tough battle to the death. And, and uh, at the end of that 18 hours, 15 of my soldiers were dead. My most vivid memory of Mogadishu was a five-ton truck coming back in on, on the airfield to our base. It was all we had to get our dead and wounded out, one five-ton truck. And as I walked up to the back of that truck to drop the tailgate, I realized what was in the back of that truck, and I didn't want to see it. And my heart was breaking as I was saying, God, where were you? God, where were you? You could have stopped this. Do you not care? Did you not hear my prayers? I dropped that tailgate and I looked in there and the dead were on bottom and the wounded were stacked up on top of the dead and the blood poured out the back of that truck like water. And it broke me. It broke me emotionally. It broke me spiritually. It just broke me. My men. I watched on a little black and white television the CNN International showed five of my men's bodies being dragged through the streets of Mogadishu as they desecrated and mutilated the bodies of my soldiers and squealed with glee as they did. I, uh, we got our, evacu our, our people evacuated and I went and sat down on my bunk just after the sun went down I was so angry with God. 
I'm going to say that again so you understand. That was not a slip of the tongue. I was angry with God. I was so angry with God that I sat on my bunk and I said, God, where were you? How could you let this happen? And then the answer came to me. And the answer is, there is no God. Because if there was a God, this would not have happened. He would have heard my prayer. He would have answered my prayers. Well, I didn't come to California to tell you there's no God. (laughs) Because the reality is, the moment I said there is no God, I heard the voice of the Lord. And he said, if there's no God... There's no hope. And I just broke emotionally, and I began to weep uncontrollably. I mean, my chest was heaving as I said, God, I'm sorry. God, I'm sorry. Please forgive me. It's just like the man Peter. I don't compare myself to Peter, but remember the story of Peter. He walked with Jesus for three and a half years. He saw him raise the dead, open blind eyes, heal the lame, cast out demons. And then after all of that, he sat by a fire the night that Jesus was on trial. And he said, no, I don't know him. I don't know him. Three times he denied him. The last time he even cursed in denying that he even knew Jesus. But the book of Acts says that that man, Peter, that denied Jesus three times, went on to preach a sermon that won what? 3,000 people. 3,000 people to the kingdom. He repented. And God forgave him and used him. And this is what I want you to take away from what I say today. The moment that I heard that voice, and it was in my heart to be repentant, before I even said, God, I'm sorry, I was forgiven. See, God sees our heart. It's not the words. He sees our heart. My heart was repentant. And I was forgiven. I was forgiven. There's nothing you've ever done. Listen to me carefully. There's nothing you've ever done that God will not forgive you for. Nothing. 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 The Bible says if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us of what? Say it with me. All unrighteousness. All. Not part of it. All. And I was forgiven the moment it was in my heart. But then I said, God, but I don't understand, Lord. I don't understand. I don't understand what happened here. And I said, God, I'm going to open my Bible and wherever I open it, God, you just give me me something. So I just just picked up a Bible. I reached down. I just opened it. I didn't look it up. You know what I opened it to? As I said, God, I don't understand. I opened it to Proverbs 3, 5. (laughs) Trust in the Lord with all thy heart, and lean not unto thine own understanding. We do not have the mind of God. There are things we're not going to be able to understand. I stood over my 49-year-old sister and watched her go into eternity with breast cancer, and she's the best Christian next to my mother, the best Christian I've ever been around. And I said, God, what are you doing? What are you doing, God? Why would you take her? And the Holy Spirit said to me, you're looking at this from your perspective. He said, I'm bringing her home. I'm bringing her home to her just reward. I said, okay. Take her. Well, the next day, we had a memorial service. Uh, We played taps, we sang God Bless America, we sang the national anthem, we memorialized our dead, and we, when that was over, that night I was standing next to my, two of my men, and uh, I was about this far from. We were talking, the sun had just gone down, it was dark, and all of a sudden there was an explosion right there. It was a mortar. Four mortars were fired. Three of them went over us, went out in the ocean. One landed right there. And we all went down. I knew I'd been hit. I'm told I was knocked out for a minute, but I got to my feet and my master sergeant was dead. I I knew he was dead. There was no question about it. He was dead. 
my lieutenant colonel was laying there screaming, my legs, my legs, my legs, and mortar had chewed him up. And, and then I looked, and there were men laying around in the circle that uh, were all hit in different places. And they uh, took me up to the a little field hospital that the United Nations was running, and a little big tent is what it is, and they, they operated on me to get as much shrapnel out as possible. And I, uh, I, next morning, I couldn't walk. I was on crutches. So I said, take me back down to where my troops are. Let's just put me back down there. They took me back down, and all I could do was lay on my bed, on my bunk. And I was praying, and I said, God, I just need something. God, I'm, I'm just, I just need something. Give me something that will help to ease the pain that I feel in my in my soul. And somebody, one of my staff came to me and handed me a facsimile and said, sir, you got a facsimile from Loveland, Colorado. And it was the guy that founded the Dollar Rental Car Company, a good, good Christian brother, a good friend of mine. And here's what it said. It said, for they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings of eagles. They shall run and not be weary, and they shall walk and not faint. Isaiah 40, 31. Wait upon the Lord means those that hope in the Lord, those that put their faith in the Lord, those that have expectations of the Lord. They brought me home the end of October. We all cleared Mogadishu, got out of there. I, my first night home, I couldn't, I was tormented. I couldn't sleep. I got up with my cane. I was on a cane by this time, and I, went, I walked downstairs, and I sat, sat down and picked up my Bible, and I sat before the Lord, and I said, Lord, I am tormented, God, because I don't know that those men, all, all 16 of those men were ready to go into eternity, that they were ready to meet you. I said, God, give me something in your word that will help me. And I just opened my, I didn't look up, it. I opened it. And I opened it to Romans 5, 19. I'd marked it. And here's what it says. It says, for as by one man's disobedience were many made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. It's talking about the obedience of Jesus Christ. When he got up off his knees in Gethsemane, after having prayed, Father, if it be thy will, let this cup pass from me. Yet not my will, but thine be done. He got up and went to Calvary. He went to the hill called Golgotha. And he died a miserable death on the cross. That we might have the hope of eternal life. And... Uh, but what he was saying to me was, were you, were you obedient to me in Mogadishu? Did you share the gospel of Jesus Christ with these men? Yes, Lord, I did. Then you'll see them again. Because they knew the truth. And the truth set them free. Somewhere in their, in, in, before they died, they accepted Jesus Christ. And I, shut, I closed my Bible. I said, God, confirm this for me. And I just closed it and reopened it into the book of John. And it said, said I not to thee that if thou wouldst believe, thou shalt see the glory of God. I'll see those men again. That's the glory of God that I'll see. I'll see them again. I'll see them in heaven because they knew the truth. The truth set them free because they turned to Jesus Christ before they died. And it can be done in the blink of an eye. It's not unlike that thief on the cross next to Jesus. There were, two, there were two people next to him. One of them mocked him, but the other one said, Father, remember me before you come into your kingdom, or when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said, on this day, you'll be with me in paradise. That man didn't get off that cross and go do any good deeds. He didn't get baptized. He didn't pay his tithes. All of those things are spiritual, scriptural, necessary. But what's necessary for salvation to have your sins washed away is to confess Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And then finally, when that mortar went off, 
I, uh, when I finally got back to my feet, I started yelling, find a doctor, find a doctor. There were men laying all around. I said, find a doctor. I didn't realize, but he was laying right next to me, laying in a pool of blood. He had walked up to speak to me in a, in a piece of shrapnel from the mortar, hit him in the femoral artery down in his groin. And he was bleeding fast, bad. Medics ran over, put me on a stretcher, put him on a stretcher, took us inside a little tent that the, uh, an Air Force Reserve unit had set up that they'd made a little medical tent out of it. And uh, they laid us side by side in, on stretchers and I reached over and took his hand, squeezed his hand and I just said, Rob, hold on, buddy. And then I started praying, God, don't let him die. Don't let him die. They put a blood pressure machine on him, put a heart rate machine on him and, uh, and then they started working on him feverishly trying to save him. And then uh, I kept squeezing his hand saying, God, God, don't let him die. Hold on, Rob, I said. And uh, he finally opened his eyes, gave me a real feeble squeeze. He opened his eyes and he looked over my eyes with very dilated eyes. And he said, he said, tell Barbara I love her. His eyes rolled back in his head and his lids closed and and he was gone. And I looked over at the machine. And his blood pressure had zeroed out. His heart rate had zeroed out. And he was, he was just, he was dead. But I wasn't willing to accept that. I just held on to him. And I kept saying, God, God, don't let him die. Can you spare this one, God? Can you spare this one? When people tell you that God is finished with America... You just stop and think about the fact that as long as we can pray, God can move. We are the remnant. He has honored the remnant before. Yes, we're in trouble. Yes, we're about to lose our constitutional republic. If we don't start praying, if we don't start seeking the Lord. But if any of you ever go to the East Coast and you go up Interstate 85... Stop at exit 105 at White's truck stop because that man that the nurse told me he's dead, let him go. Let him go, sir, he's dead. That man is running a medical station at exit 205 and he was chosen as the number one doctor in the Shenandoah Valley of Virginia in 2014. He's alive today. A year ago, a year ago this month, he and I were having dinner in Washington. And uh, I said to him, Rob, you know you were dead. And uh, his eyes watered. And uh, he just nodded. His sister told me, You don't understand. He is on fire for the Lord now. He teaches Sunday school. He's a deacon in the church. He takes children to a summer camp, a Christian summer camp. He's on fire for the Lord because he knows he was spared for a reason. And I want you to uh, contemplate where you stand with the Lord. Where do you stand with the Lord? Do you know him as your personal Savior? It's not going to make you a perfect person by any means to accept Jesus Christ as your Savior, but it's going to make you a, a, a person with hope, a person with a hope for the future. I see the light in the darkness. I want hope for the hopeless and rest for the weary mind. And you've got truth for the taking, but my heart won't be shaken if today be the day that I die. Whoa, 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 whoa. And I won't worry about tomorrow or fear in times of trouble. I keep my heart seeking. I will keep my heart
seeking you. Whoa, oh, 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 when that day draws me with my darkest fear, I will keep my heart seeking you. And when your kingdom comes and your will is done, I will keep my heart seeking you. Whoa, 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 whoa,